into educational legacy of Vasily Sukhaminsky. Vasily Sukhaminsky included 10 months uh, study, thank you, in Moscow during 1987 and 1988, and he visited uh, Sukhaminsky's school in Ukraine in 2009. He is the author of Each One Must Shine, The Educational Legacy of Shubinetsky, and has translated two of his most significant works, My Heart I Give to Children and Our School in the Parish, all of them that are um, at the front counter tonight. He appeared on the ABC program Conversations, talking about Shubinetsky with Richard Feidler, and you can listen to that on the Conversations program as well. Or oh, you can just um, tune in again later and listen to this event when we pop it up on YouTube in a couple of weeks as well. So um, sit back, enjoy, and uh, welcome to Alan Cockrell. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you to everyone for coming. <clears throat> I know it's very close to Christmas and it's also very hot tonight here in Brisbane. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people tuning in uh, around Australia and overseas, some at at least one person I know is up in an ungodly hour. So thank you very much to all those people who've set aside the time. Um, <clears throat> this is the book that I'm presenting to you tonight, Our School in Publish. It's not my book. It's Sukhraminsky's book. And I've translated it and, in a sense, interpreted it. So Sukhraminsky's book, is about his school, and his school was his life. He lived in the school building with his wife, who was also teaching there. Uh, he raised his children there, who also went to the school. And he didn't really have much life outside the school and education. Um, his wife said that all his free time practically was spent on his work, whether it was writing books, whether it was extracurricular activities with the children. Even in the last years of his life, when he knew he didn't have long to live, when he had um, pieces of shrapnel in his chest that were entering his heart, um, he was even writing in his hospital bed. So I'm going to talk about Sukhaminsky's school um, and what made it special. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to read because I wanted to make sure I've got certain thoughts down and certain ideas across, but hopefully there'll be lots of time for questions uh, at the end, and then I'll be able to respond more spontaneously, hopefully, to your questions. If you are online, uh, please use the chat function and enter questions in there, and Chrissy will pass them on to me. So what made Sukhaminsky School special? I think one of the one thing that immediately came to my mind and that is sort of a precondition for everything else that he did was that he spent so long there and the teachers there who worked with him also worked there for a very long time. So when he was writing the book, he talks about all the teachers, how long each of them had been at the school. And I did a little bit of maths and on average, they've all been there over 15 years. So that gives you a bit of an idea. And he himself there was principal for 22 years. So that immediately had certain benefits. Um, it meant the teachers became a very cohesive group. Uh, it meant they knew the families extremely well. He was working in a rural school. By the time he reached the end of his tenure, he and many of his teachers were teaching the students to form students. So the parents would bring the child in and they'd say, you know, you'll probably find he's a bit like me or, and they might end up sitting in the same desk as their parent. Um, and they developed a shared philosophy. The second thing I thought that was remarkable about his school and perhaps related to the first one is that there were such close ties between the school and the families. The school and the families worked hand in hand. Um, Sukhaminsky and his senior staff ran a parenting program. So students, parents, two years before their children started school, would join this parenting program. And they had five different groups for different age groups of children. So 
took on senior new staff would be teaching the children about child development, child psychology, what sort of routines were healthy for the children that have. And this created a very close relationship between the school and the families. Sukhum Institute also felt that schools should teach senior students about being in families and parenting. So even though it wasn't part of the official curriculum, he made time for some classes in the senior school on parenting. So you can sort of imagine with this uh, scenario that the parents who were bringing kids to his school have been introduced to ideas on parenting even while they were at school and then they come in as parents and bring their children. Then staff at Sukhum's school work with parents to help students establish healthy routines. Children were given health checkups by a doctor two years before they commenced. And if they picked up any hearing or any issues with their circulatory, their lungs or anything else, the way they addressed it was lifestyle adjustments. Sukhominsky was um, spending a lot of time outdoors, healthy diet. And if necessary, the children's diets would supplement um, and that would be paid for for with from the local collective farm or like so they were interested in school that was necessary. Um, Sukhaminsky recommended that children get up early. So for the junior school, their hours of sleep were recommended to be eight to six, and then in the senior school, more like nine to five thirty. Um, and the idea was the children wouldn't do any homework at night because that would affect the quality of their sleep. They get up early, do their homework before school, and Sukhaminsky maintained that. <clears throat> They could do twice as much in the same time before school as they could do after school. So maybe instead of spending in the senior school one, instead of spending three hours on homework, they might spend one and a half hours. In the junior school, they might spend 20 minutes. Um, outdoor living was recommended, and families were assisted to construct, to construct outdoor shelters where children could do their homework. Uh, children were trained from an early age to use an alarm clock to rise early and complete their homework before school. Another aspect of this close relationship with families was that Sukhaminsky's whole educational approach was geared towards creating empathetic human beings. And this started in the family. So the very first year at school, the children, he would talk to the children about their parents and, and try and help them appreciate all the things their parents did for them and help them to do something in return. So each of the, stu each of the students, uh, when they started school, would plant apple trees at home, one for their mother, one for their father, one for each of their grandparents. And they would look after these trees until they bore fruit and then bring the fruit and present it to their parents. So this you can sort of see um, that he was inculcating strong family relationships and helping to, to build that bond between the school and the family. A third thing that was special about Sukhaminsky School was the extracurricular program. So, <clears throat> Because the children weren't doing homework after school, they had this enormous reserve of free time to spend after school. And there was this very extensive extracurricular program. So there were probably 40 or 50 clubs and activity groups going on that the children could choose from. So they might start off as junior students you know, growing flowers or doing some fret work with a plywood making models. And then gradually as they progressed through the school, their activities became more and more complex. Um, this gave children a chance to apply knowledge that they learned in class. 
It also provided a very rich experiential background that helped when they were teaching children, they could refer to their experiences, to the skills that they'd already developed. It gave children the opportunity to develop their talents and abilities because the offer, the activities, I'll just read a list of some of the activities that they could engage in. Flower growing, horticulture, plant breeding, soil science, making fertilizers, agriculture, animal husbandry, beekeeping, carpentry, metalwork, electronics and design, making model aeroplanes, painting, singing, instrumental music, creative writing, studying local history, ceramics, puppetry, folk work, drama, embroidery, the Society for Nature Conservation, and clubs where students could go more deeply into academic subjects, such as mathematics, biology, and foreign languages. As most children participated in several clubs at once, they developed a very broad range of skills and abilities. This is something I experienced when I was teaching. <clears throat> I'm by nature fairly quiet, and I spend a lot of time reading at my desk and doing things. And when my voice doesn't get much exercise, it takes a while to break it in. <clears throat> I'll just read something that Sukhaninsky wrote. <clears throat> Thanks to the diversity of work in the clubs, by the time they progressed to grade eight, all of our students have acquired a broad range of skills and are able to find a pursuit to their liking. Students completing grade eight are able to work with metal using metalworking hand tools and machine tools, turn wood on a lathe, make simple wooden objects, frames, stools, rulers, compasses, assemble models of machinery from pre-made parts, make metal parts for such models, make tools for working with wood and metal, assemble metalworking machine tools, install electrical cabling, electrical equipment, and installations combining an electric motor and working machinery, assemble radios, cultivate soil, sow crops and manage them, harvest the crop, manage animals, drive a car and a tractor, prepare grafted cuttings of fruit trees, and grow grapes and fruits. The mastery of such a broad range of skills enables students in the senior years to master comparatively complex skills within a relatively short time. So you can see that <clears throat> children were applying their knowledge. They weren't just, it wasn't just an academic program for them. The experience of going to Sukhansky school was that you attended lessons, and then after lessons, you engaged in all these practical activities where you could apply what you learned in the class or gain new experiences, or deepen your knowledge. Although Sukhominsky didn't want students doing homework late at night, he didn't discourage students from reading if they were reading for pleasure, reading for interest, even reading about mathematics, if that was what took their fancy. But the point was that there was no tension involved. It was, it was they were reading out of interest. Another benefit of the extracurricular program was the way it facilitated peer tutoring. Workshops were equipped in such a way that students in the primary classes often worked alongside children in the secondary classes <clears throat> and learned from them. This allowed the younger children to apply knowledge and skills that were exceptional for their age and also had a very beneficial effect on the moral development of the older children who saw their own virtues reflected in their younger friends. That last expression I've taken straight from <clears throat> Sukhaminsky's book. So the skills, um, the knowledge that they had developed, the discipline that they had developed, they started to pass on to their younger friends. <clears throat> the extracurricular program also allowed staff to mix informally with students and develop close relationships with them, facilitating pastoral care. Sukhominsky viewed this as one of the most important aspects of life at his school. So in every school, there are children who will struggle and who teachers may find difficult to work with. Often these extracurricular clubs were a way of getting through to these children, making contact with them, developing a relationship with them. 
and then they would start to engage and start to succeed at their studies. The extracurricular program also allowed students to go far beyond the curriculum in subjects they were most interested in. And because the intellectual life of the school community was an integrated whole, some of their knowledge rubbed off on the other students, raising the general level of intellectual development. So Sukhaminsky believed that if there are some children in the class who've gone way beyond the curriculum and can talk about all these interesting things, no one in that class is going to fail that subject. Fourth thing that was special about Sukhaminsky School, and which I think is particularly relevant uh, now with all the environmental issues we have, is the extent to which the whole school program was integrated with the natural environment surrounding the school. Sukhaminsky was personally involved in a preschool program that was run almost completely outdoors in nature. Uh, if you've read My Heart I Give to Children, you know all about that. Sukhaminsky viewed nature as the wellspring of living thought and believed that the most effective way to develop language and thought was to teach children to describe their direct observations of nature and to think about the cause and effect relationships in nature. He also taught children from an early age to appreciate the beauty of nature and educated them, in, I'm quoting from the book, in a spirit of heartfelt care and concern for all that is living and beautiful, for plants, flowers, birds and animals. He educated a community of environmentalists. Students at Sukhominsky School did not just learn to appreciate the beauty of nature. They took a hands-on approach to protecting the natural environment and improving soil quality. Over a period of 20 years, the school community completely transformed an area of 40 hectares around the school converting it from barren clay soil into lush meadows and flowering orchards. <clears throat> Children in grade one collected seeds from trees, which were then planted to prevent erosion in fields. They selected the best seeds from grain crops for use in plant breeding trials. They rescued injured wildlife and cared for it in an animal hospital. As they moved through the school, their projects gradually became more ambitious and their range of skills more complex. By the time they were in the senior classes, they were studying the microflora of the soil and working on ways of enhancing the microflora to improve soil fertility. A fifth thing that was special about Sorovinsky School was the cultural breadth of the students' learning and the extent to which students were encouraged to become autonomous, lifelong learners. As students progressed through the school, they were encouraged to become more and more independent in the way they studied. In senior classes, Sukhaminsky staff utilised what he called a lecture laboratory system of lessons, and some sections of the senior curriculum were set aside for independent study. Throughout their school years, students were encouraged to read widely and to go far beyond the curriculum. All students were expected to independently read an extensive selection of classics from national and world literature that includes over 250 works from antiquity up to the time that Sukhaminsky was writing, from Homer and Ramayana to Steinbeck and Salinger. Work in the extracurricular programs also encouraged self-directed learning. A sixth feature of Sukhaminsky's school was the extent to which the school promoted health and resilience. Students spent a great deal of time outdoors in physical activity and much of the summer in the fields and forests around the school. So they generally had camps for the children and quite often they'd be helping out on the collective farm, harvesting melons or cutting hay or whatever. Students were trained from an early age to be self-disciplined, to rise early, and complete a set of gymnastics exercises. The whole school program is structured with student health in mind. The most demanding classes being held in the mornings when students were fresh and the intellectual intensity gradually diminishing through the day. Students were given regular medical checkups and any health issues addressed. Special arrangements were made for students who experienced eye strain with some students being given break in the middle of lessons. Regular checks were made to ensure each child had a suitably sized desk, 
so they develop good posture. And the seventh point that I'm going to focus on and read an extract from Sukhominsky's book is that students were trained from an early age to be empathetic and to care for their friends and families. Empathy was considered to be the foundation of morality. Since the inculcation of empathy or humaneness is at the very core of Sukhominsky's approach to education, I'll read an extract from the book, which actually has the heading, Educating Sensitivity and Empathy. The ABC of educating humaneness is that a child finds personal joy in giving the warmth of their soul to others. In our experience, the most important thing in this subtle area of educational work is that the child should feel the sorrows, cares and suffering of another human being and personally respond to the one who needs help or sympathy. The early childhood years are especially favourable for this sort of educational work, as little children react particularly sensitively to others' suffering. Since grief, worries and suffering are always present in our social environment, a thoughtful and sensitive teacher who can talk about such things expressively will always be able to conjure up vivid images in a child's imagination and influence the feelings of the little ones listening to them. We tell children about people who need help, sympathy and heartfelt consideration. Once I told our little grade one students about a seven-year-old boy named Misha, and I should mention here that children entered grade one at this time at the age of seven, so these are the children's, this is the same age as the children. Uh, about a seven-year-old boy named Misha, who had been bedridden due to illness for two years and could not come to school. Straight away, the children wanted to visit the boy. The first visit to the sick child left a deep impression on the children's souls. They told him about school and brought him toys and drawings. The next day, they brought him a box of alphabet blocks. After that, visiting the sick boy was not something they had to do, but something they deeply wanted to do, an inner imperative. Each one visited Misha whenever they wanted. Misha memorised the alphabet and learned to read. In the school workshop, some of the students made a little table on which he could write. All the students in the older classes, as well as in grade one, wanted to be part of Misha's success. For his part, the boy wanted to do something to express his thanks to his friends. It turned out he had an exceptional gift for drawing, and he drew pictures and gave them to his friends. Summer came, and Misha spent cold days in the open air. His bed was put in the shade of some trees, and the children helped him undergo a course of sunbaking. They played on the grass near his bed, told him stories, and acted out dramatised versions of folk tales. Misha could read aloud very expressively, and he began to read poetry and stories to his friends. Another year passed, and again the children spent the summer with Misha. He kept up with them in his studies and transitioned successfully to grade three. The boy grew stronger. In the words of the children, his sick legs woke up. When Misha stood on his own two legs and walked several steps, each of his friends experienced this as their own personal good fortune. For several months, the children brought Misha to school in a little wheelchair. During the spring, Misha's walking improved significantly, and when lessons started, he walked to school himself. Each year, his health improved. He graduated from secondary school and works as a metal worker at a car factory. He's become a sportsman. Caring for their friend played a major role in the spiritual life of the children. Each one felt they had invested their strength and energy in a person who had been brought back to life. Each child who had befriended and helped Misha developed a trait that could be called gentleness or tenderness. Human grief has many faces and is unique in each case. The important thing is that children are able to bring joy to others. Then they will feel others' grief naturally and will themselves find a way to engage in that most joyful creative labour that is humaneness. I'm just going to check with Chris how we're going for time. No, you're, you're right. Because yeah. I've got more to read, but I'll stop. 
I told those same grade one students about the life of former partisan Andrei Stepanovich N. During the Great Patriotic War, fascists killed his wife and took his two little sons, aged two and four, to Germany. They published a note in the local newspaper stating that the partisan sons would be educated in the Aryan spirit and would become enemies of communism. When the war ended, Andrei Stepanovich went to search for his sons but his efforts were fruitless. He could not forget his terrible grief. He worked as an electrician on the state farm, but kept to himself and avoided contact with people. In such cases, a special kind of help is needed, a sensitive, tactful awareness of the feelings of the grief-stricken person. The person who needs such help is sensitive to the slightest insincerity or artificiality. I tried to awaken feelings in the hearts of the little children that would allow them to offer help and sympathy in a way that did not rub salt into painful wounds, but gave warmth through their kindness. They simply needed to bring joy to the man. In the remote lane where Andrei Stepanovich lived, we pulled out the weeds and planted apple trees. Andrei Stepanovich did not pay any attention to us for a long time, and we were disappointed. But then he began to come out of his house to see us. We saw how he was drawn to the sound of the children's voices. Then he asked us to bring him some grapevines. This request brought us great joy. Andrei Stepanovich planted the grapevines, invited us into his house and gave us apples to eat. A lively conversation followed. Andrei Stepanovich asked the children about school. The children told him about their games and their walks in the forest and shared their secrets. They had a little cave in the forest in which they hid their toy weapons. They knew of a secret place on the bank of the lake where pipes swam. The following Sunday, Andrei Stepanovich went with the children to the forest. It was an unforgettable day. Andrei Stepanovich could talk very engagingly about nature. He showed the children a hare's burrow and a fox's den, a squirrel and a muskrat by the dam wall. It was as if the man had been waiting for years to meet people who really felt his grief but would never mention it. And there Stepanovich stopped being a loner. The long extinguished need for human company awoke in him again. Each Sunday the children went with him to the forest, riverbanks, lakes and steppe, and everywhere they discovered something new and previously unknown. During the spring and summer holidays they rode to an island, chose a remote spot, cooked dinner and collected natural specimens and botanical samples. During 10 years of friendship, that's the duration of school at that time in the Soviet Union, during the 10 years of friendship, excuse me, during the 10 years of friendship, no one broke the promise they had given. Not a single word was spoken about you, Andrei Stepanovich passed as a partisan. No one asked him, to tell them anything about the cruel years of the war. The students became adults and their friendship with him became even stronger. The years of friendship filled with the mutual creation of joy for each other educated a sensitivity in the children to a person's inner world, an urge for human fellowship. One who has this urge is led by some sixth sense to people in need of kindness. My pupils found such people when they were studying in grade four. Returning home from the forest one day, they saw an old man. It was a hot day and the old man was also making his way home. The children helped him to carry some clothes. The children's heartfelt sensitivity allowed them to see that the old man was sad about something. He's grieving about something big, said the girls. They learned from their parents that their new friend was a 70-year-old retired doctor who had recently moved from a neighbouring village. Several years ago, he had buried his wife, several months ago, he had buried his wife of nearly 50 years and moved away from there so that nothing would remind him of the loss of such a dear person. Now he went every Sunday to his wife's grave with flowers he grew in a little greenhouse. The children sensed that the old man needed sympathy and friendship. On the eve of the following Sunday, they took the doctor a bunch of roses. The old man was moved. They asked his permission to accompany him to the neighbouring village, but he declined. 
They accompanied him only as far as the forest and waited for his return. They kept doing that every Sunday. The children were not deterred by rain or cold. The children began to help their new friend look after his flowers, and he taught them the secrets of floriculture. He was delighted that the children were so interested in flowers. He passed on to the children his love of beauty, teaching them to appreciate its subtle shades. The children wanted to bring Pyotr Afanasiewicz, that was the old doctor's name, some joy. They found out when his former wife's birthday was celebrated and placed a bouquet of flowers on her grave the day before. Pyotr Afanasiewicz was deeply moved, and from that time he did everything in his power to show his appreciation. In spring, he helped the children establish a nursery of gladioli and a new grove of lilac bushes. Looking after the flowers brought the children new joys. Each of them created a flower bed at home and built some greenhouses. Flowers became part of the spiritual life of their families. Two years later, the old doctor died. His death was a great loss for us. He was buried next to his wife. From time to time, bouquets of flowers appear on their graves. The young people do not forget the one who showed them another facet of human beauty and kindness. We consider such lessons in humanity an important component of moral education. Here we are dealing with the education of positive emotions. Many years of experience have convinced us that the education of emotions is not an isolated, narrow task, but the very essence of the whole process of establishing a person's moral culture, moral character. For 20 years, I've been observing our students' perception, interpretation, and reinterpretation of the concepts, truths, and norms that make up the values of our society. These observations confirm that a child's sensitivity, thoughtfulness, and personal attitude to the words of a teacher who is explaining the essence of moral values depends on the extent to which they have developed positive emotions. A student who has not developed positive emotions remains indifferent to the teacher's words. If a student takes the misfortunes and sufferings of others to heart, if they have frequently experienced a burning desire to come to another person's aid and to express that desire in action, they take a teacher's words as a challenge directed to them personally, even when the teacher has not directly addressed them. We become deeply convinced that emotional sensitivity and emotional refinement stimulate thought and reflection on the essence of moral exhortations and advice. Soviet research proved long ago that activity in the cortex of the brain is stimulated by the emotional centers of the subcortex. I'll just digress there to say that was a central principle also in Sukhumi's approach to intellectual education. The children had to be engaged through feelings of wonder, curiosity, and excitement. The main impulse for the activity of the cortex comes from the subcortex, wrote Pavlov. If these emotions are excluded, the cortex will lose its main source of energy. Neurological science relating to the higher functions of the human nervous system help explain what goes on in the hidden recesses of a child's psyche. It also helps us find a way to educate children properly. The most significant of all the complex processes taking place in the spiritual words of our students is the formation of personal convictions and personal views. The process of transforming truths into the flesh and blood of actions and behavior. There can be no doubt that this process depends hugely on emotional education and the formation of positive feelings. Educating humane feelings is one of the most important aspects of developing moral refinement. Humaneness is impossible without sensitivity to other human beings. It is simpler to love humanity at large than to love a single person. It is more difficult to help a single human being and to affirm that I love my nation. Each person embarking on life must be not only a skillful worker able to produce material goods, but also a warm, responsive, sensitive human being. Berlinski's words, spoken over a hundred years ago, will never lose their significance. We may be carpenters, metal workers, or factory workers, but will we be true human beings? That is the question. The most important and most difficult challenge 
is ensuring our students can embark on life as genuine human beings. And that's probably his education philosophy in a nutshell, that nice statement. So I'll stop there and throw it open for right. questions. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Bring this over here. Um, we have quest we have a question from the audience already. So oh, yes, thanks, thanks a lot, for that. Uh, My question is is really about the, the relationship between the school and the state. And and you, you mentioned the collective and the uh, trade unions local. Were there uh, state monies that that supported the school? And also more generally, what was the relationship between the school and the education department, the, the state yeah. education department? Okay, so the question is, what was the relationship between the school and the Soviet state? Um, well, all schools in the Soviet Union were state-funded. Um, Sukhomsky would have had some additional funds from the local trade unions and the collective farm, and I'm guessing some from royalties on his books, because um, in the last 10 years of his life, his books would have sold hundreds of thousands of copies and he would have got some royalties from that. But generally speaking, the school, all schools were funded primarily by the state. Um, the other issue that I don't know sure if this was in your question um, is the extent to which his approach was in harmony with state ideology. Um, and fundamentally it was. Um, but within the Communist Party, there were different factions or different trends or different tendencies. And we know what happened under Stalin, where millions and millions, mainly party members, were the ones that were purged. So it was dangerous to try and define what communism meant, or it could be dangerous. So Raminsky flourished under Khrushchev. So Khrushchev was the one who denounced Stalin and said, we've got to change our ways, we're going to be more liberal. And Sukhominsky and many others like him flourished in those circumstances. So during that same time, they published uh, Solzhenitsyn's One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich about life in, a, in the Gulag in a concentration camp. So, um, Sukhominsky did encounter difficulties in the last three years of his life, uh, mainly after Khrushchev was deposed and Brezhnev came to power. Um, and then he was attacked quite brutally in the press. Um, the teacher's newspaper, which had a circulation of about two million, um, published a series of articles attacking him uh, and didn't publish anything in his defence, even though Lots of teachers wrote in his defence, and even the editorial staff at the newspaper refused to denounce him. Um, but there were others who supported him, and ultimately his supporters won through. But uh, there can be little doubt that the attacks at the end of his life hastened his death um, because of the emotional strain it put him under when he had a heart condition. Fascinating. I've got a question from online too. So Neil Hawkes has asked, um, firstly, thanking you for bringing these works um, to a new generation of educators. But what advice would you give to us to integrate his thinking into modern education systems that seem insensitive to a humane relational approach to education? Did you get that question? Um, do you think the online listeners would have got that? No, I, I, well, because um, I'm facing it, they might have. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, what advice would I give to people working in our education system and how they can apply Sukhominsky's ideas? Um, I think if you think about the things that I said were special about Sukhominsky's school, then that would give you some hint in that direction. So I think the first thing we've got to do is stop encouraging principals to move on at the moment at least in state schools, not so much in independent schools. Um, the only way a student uh, principal can get promoted to a higher position is to move to a bigger school. And this quite often has disastrous consequences because when a principal moves on to another school, there's usually a temporary principal put in their place, 
and this can cycle on. So two, two state schools that I've worked in, um, both had stable, good principals, um, but because of certain circumstances, they moved on, and then there was a succession of several other principals. Um, and who, I should actually say in fairness to the other principals too, that they may be put under all sorts of pressure by the department in terms of what's the data to need from above, and that plan has definitely created a lot of pressure on principals and teachers. Um, to narrow their focus onto the um, development of certain core skills. Um, and narrowing your focus doesn't necessarily help you develop those core skills. It may be that those core skills are developed more naturally if the curriculum is broader and you engage students in a variety of activities. Um, I think a focus on health is really important. Um, we used to have school nurses. I don't I think they're pretty rare now. They might be coming back in high schools. Um, I think we need to give a lot more attention to student health and every child should be screened for sight and hearing at a minimum in grade one. Um, and we should, we should make sure that children's health is supported in every way. Um, I think we should take less, less pre, uh, some of the pressure off prep students who are currently expected to master um, basic skills and literacy maybe a little quicker than might be desirable. Um, encouraging length of tenure, maybe we can work out ways that student uh, principal can get promoted and stay in the school just by the fact that they're doing a good job in that school so that they can be more integrated in the community. Um, uh, extracurricular activities, um, maybe we could look at how we can integrate after school programs um, with what's happening in, in the school um, so that um, they feed into each other. Um, spending time outdoors, um, hands-on activities, um, all of those things I think are important uh, in a holistic education and I guess the other thing is teachers need to have confidence in their own knowledge. Quite often teachers are not given the respect, um, their knowledge isn't sufficiently respected I think. Um, one school I was working at we had a very effective oral language program. Uh, we had a lot of children coming into the school in prep with little English, a lot of children from migrant backgrounds. Um, but one of the principals who came and said, but is that program evidence-based? Where's the research? The teachers have been doing it and it was working. I don't think you always need to have um, knowledge from, the, from a, an academic or knowledge from a, I, I think, you can see teachers rebelling to a certain extent in, in the way that they're opposing that plan. And I think it's easy to say, have you left the profession? Um, but, and teachers often are, are struggling just to keep, you know, survive in a difficult environment. Um, but yes, I think teachers do need to back their judgment and speak up when they think things are, are being done wrongly. Got a couple of questions to the floor. Yes. First one is uh, Have there been any studies done in the Soviet Union or post Soviet Union on the uh, graduates of that school? Yes. Um, the question is Have there been studies of graduates of students in the school? school? Heritage, how did they yeah. the, full um, the short answer. Nothing that I can talk about except to say that um, even in this book, uh, Sukhavinsky published figures of numbers of students who graduated who entered tertiary institutions from his school. And I think if you were to do look at the data, you'd find it was a very high percentage for a rural school. Um, there is a book of reminiscences of past students talking about him. Um, 
But I don't know that in the Soviet Union they had the same sort of tradition of collecting data and statistical studies and things that we have. Um, and I don't know of any studies that that would particularly look at that and compare his graduates with graduates from other schools. Um, but certainly the anecdotal evidence is that uh, it was a very effective system. And visitors to the school were just wowed by what they saw. So Sukhomsky's books were read by millions of teachers and thousands of them came to his school and wanted to just see what was happening. And the sort of comments they made suggest that what was happening there was special. The question I have is, to what degree were you able to implement the basic, the essence of Sukhaminsky in your own teaching? That's a very hard question. <laughs> yeah. um, that one. Yes. The question is, to what extent was I able to implement Sukhaminsky's principles in my own teaching? I don't think I give myself a terribly good score. Um, um, I certainly tried. Um, I taught in a Steiner school for a couple of years and I did grow flowers with the kids for Mother's Day and things like that. Um, I tried to relate, honestly, and I, I don't know, I might be being a bit harsh on myself. Um, I certainly had some very good experiences. Um, when I was at Dimor State School, I coordinated something called the Health Promoting Schools Program. Um, and we engaged community resources to help promote health in the school. Um, we, we started a community garden. The children were growing vegetables in the school garden and we were using them in the tuck shop. The kids got involved in helping improve the school tuck shop menu. They came up with some creative ideas. Um, at that time, um, this was in quite a low social economic area. I won't say the school, but it was in um, one of the poorest areas in Ipswich. Um, and probably the parents were watching Big Brother, and one of the kids came up with the idea that they were going to vote out the worst thing in the tuck shop. Each, each week they voted out they voted out the worst thing in the tuck shop. So they got rid of some fatty foods and things like that. So that was a very positive experience and that was sort of in line with Sukhaminsky's ideas about promoting health in schools and also probably community engagement because we did something we did in cooperation with the council and um, the local health department. Um, in my work as a teacher librarian, I, um, I try to engage the children through stories, which is also something Sukhaminsky did. Um, and I ran a chess club at another school, um, which was very enjoyable and successful. We got to the state finals after a couple of years. Um, so, but you can't... When you're working in a state school, you're beholden to a system. That's one thing. Um, and I probably worked in 20 years, I probably worked under almost as many principles. So each principal has their own ideas. <clears throat> and then, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure I've got the best personality for being a teacher. Um, I think maybe I'm a little bit too much up in my head and not enough coming from the heart sometimes, or I'm a bit frightened. So um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I'd have survived at Sukhaminsky School, I'm not. but maybe in that environment I'd have flourished. It's hard to say. But it, all of those of you who worked as a teacher, you know how difficult it is and how demanding it can be, and you have good days and some not so good days. So. Um, I certainly don't consider myself to be an example of what sort of Mr. was. I think he was. Well, but uh, at least, uh, 
At least I can translate his books and you know, yeah. It's it's also something that sounds like it's very systemic. And so um, one person working within a system might be a bit tricky to kind of actually change the way no, the school operates. I've had some wonderful principals and I've worked with wonderful teachers. And I think some of them were more suited to it than I am. So that's just been perfectly honest and right. Um, but I don't think there's any work that's more valuable than the teacher's work. So I gave it my best shot. <laughs> that's what I'd say. We have a couple of online questions, but is there another um, person in the audience who had a question before? No, um, I might go to an online question. So Marco Publishing um, has said congratulations and has asked, your engagement with Shukovsky has endured for decades. Can you share with us what it was that first awakened your interest in this educator and what has maintained your interest in him over the years? What was your first contact? Okay, so the question is, how do I get interested in Sukhominsky and how come I've kept going for so long? So I first encountered his work in 1986 or seven, probably early 1987. Um, it really starts with high school because um, I grew up in the 60s. I finished high school the year Sukhominsky died. So I was quite a gifted student, but, and people said I ought to do sciences, but I, I was looking at what was, because I, we were living in the shadow of nuclear war, in the threat of the shadow of the threat of nuclear war. And my driving thought was, science has given us all this power, but human nature isn't refined. So, we're not fit to have this power. We've got to, the thing that we need to focus on is how do we refine human nature? So that's been the driving impulse. Then when I got to university, I took up yoga. I studied a little bit of psychology, but I actually ended up studying Russian literature and yoga were my main source of sustenance. And I became involved with a group that started up a school in Melbourne and then one in Warwick here in Queensland, um, which is now called the Total Health and Education Foundation. So I was interested in holistic education, but then I was also interested in my Russian studies and I decided to study Russian education because I had a feeling they had, had a bit more of a focus on moral development than what we had. And I just came across Sukhansky's books in a bookshop in Melbourne and I just started reading and just something clicked and I said, yeah, this guy really has something to say that's important. And since then I've been focused on his work. I wrote a PhD about him. And then since then I've always had in the back of my mind, look, no one else is doing this. Um, if I don't do it, I don't know who else is going to. So. I just thought, if I don't do anything else before I die, if I translate some of his books, that will be something. And the reason it's taken so long is most of that time I've been working full-time or close to full-time as a teacher. And as you know, that doesn't leave a lot of energy left over. So, um, But I, I've, now that I've retired, I hope to get a few more books translated. Could I ask one more question? Maybe. There is one more online. I'll just get this one first. Um, actually, there's two more online. Um, uh, so one of them is from um, Terence Lovett, who says, a school principal said to me recently that principals now are expected to be managers but not leaders. How do you think Vasily would respond to a comment like that? Managers, not le leaders. Yeah, that's the question is uh, Terry Lovett, who's a professor emeritus, is a very distinguished scholar, has just asked the question. He said, the principal just told him, principals are now expected to be managers, not leaders. How would the Sukhumanski respond to that? Well, that's diametrically opposed to Sukhumanski's thinking. Um, Sukhavinsky said the principal should be the best teacher in the school and he should teach, he should keep teaching and he should teach the other teachers how to teach. So if you look, if you read this book, you'll see how he spent his time. 
He spent maybe 15 minutes a day with a what we might call a business manager. He looked after the, the physical side of the school. His focus was totally on the children and on teaching. And when he took on a new teacher, he would work with them for years. He would visit their lessons, they would visit his lessons, a dozen lessons a year each for maybe four or five years. So that was his focus. The principal, and he actually put his position up for election every year at the, at the school council, which is all the teachers and some of the parents. His position was up for election every year. It wasn't. But that was his view, that the principal should be the best teacher in the school. Um, I, I suppose that also answers the question for Tatiana about the role of the school principal in the process of implementing these ideas. So it's really important it's, to get the principal. Yes. And the other thing that's interesting to look at, you look at is these priority, priorities. <clears throat> the younger the children were, the more he involved he was. So he started, if you read my heart, I give to children, it's the experimental preschool program that he ran. The earlier he got involved with the children, the better. The younger they were, the more important it was that he engaged with them because that's when they developed their habits of thinking and their attitudes. Um, so, yes. Yeah, definitely his focus was on teaching and on the children, firstly on the children. Yeah. I think the last question is actually a comment about um, knowing the principles. I like that as well. So, um, yeah, I think there's lots of affirmation of your um, thoughts and observations mm -hmm. from online as well. Um, so we, we are at the point where we do have to go to um, the signing part of the evening and the, um, the chatting amongst ourselves part of the evening. It has been really, really fascinating. I'm not an educator, but um, it just it really sounds like this particular um, book um, would be absolutely essential if you are an educator in um, rethinking your own processes. So, um, you know, I think it's been really amazing for me to listen to you. Thank you very much for bringing this to us. We really don't get to talk about translated works much, and that means that we don't think outside our own paradigm. So I think it's really great that you have brought this book to us and that it's now available to purchase, you know, at a bookshop like us. So thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you to Avid Reader for allowing me to this year and thank you to everyone for coming and to all the online viewers thank you for making the time as well great thank you so much so um we do have time now to um have a look at the books and to have more of a chat um I, it's probably because it's insanely crazy inside it's probably best to have a, the signing out here rather than to move inside because of the christmas rush yeah one more question which, which countries and which languages um, have proven to be the most uh, popular? We've seen the Soviet bloc countries. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, use this one. Yeah. So, well, yes. yeah. um, his work is obviously popular in Soviet bloc countries. So, Sukhansky visited East Germany, Hungary, um, Cuba. And his work is very popular still in Ukraine, Russia. Since the 80s, it's been very popular in China. So a, a large amount of his work's been translated into um, Chinese. Um, English is really where we need to push it. it. Another interesting thing, my own book about Sukharminsky, Trong Shine, was translated into Korean and sold more copies in one year there than it has in 20 years in all English-speaking countries combined. So I, I think there's a certain cultural arrogance in English-speaking countries that we think we know it all, um, that we're not as interested in translated works maybe, um, and also probably the fact that I, I went with a, a recognised publisher in Korea, they approached me. Whereas I've self published. Though the first one, my own book, was published by an academic publisher in New York. That only sold 270 copies the four years they had it. So, 
Um, it's very hard to get noticed. It's really hard to get noticed. There's millions of books published every year. And I wish people who were still online, I should have said this when they were online. There still are quite a few online. Um, well, I just ask a favour of you. Please talk to other people about Sukhumansky um, and let them know that this man exists. If you read more about him, learn more about him, he's just a wonderful human being. And there's so much in his works to stimulate thought and, um, and to inspire. So if you can tell other people about Sukhumansky and maybe we'll have a few more people reading his work. Thanks very much to Alan. Thank you.